and welcome to Indianomics. This week we ask an important question. How serious is India's water crisis? Is this the result of two consecutive droughts that can be mitigated with one or two good monsoons? Or is it more a serious problem of sustained shortage of both surface and groundwater that has reached a crisis level and that can be answered only by a change in laws, cropping patterns, taxes and indeed a change in lifestyles and attitudes? In the course of the next half hour, we will be speaking with a bunch of experts, Dr. Ashok Gulati, economist and former chairman of Agricultural Prices Commission, Matthew Rodell, a NASA scientist who was the first to spot depleting groundwater levels in North India way back in 2009, Shashi Shekhar, Secretary, Water Ministry, Central Government, Arunabhago, CEO, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, and Himanshu Thakkar, Coordinator, South Asia Network for Dams, Rivers and People. Well, the last four are already here. So first, let me welcome Matthew Rodell, Shashi Shekhar, Arunabhago, Ghosh and Himanshu Thakkar. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me. First, Matthew, uh, you were the first one to spot this uh, uh, receding uh, water table in North India. Can you update us? Have things gotten even worse in North India? Yes, yeah, so, so based on the data from the GRACE satellites, we saw back in 2009 that there was a rapid rate of depletion in North India uh, caused by, by groundwater levels dropping. Um, and that's mainly caused by people using uh, a lot of groundwater for irrigating crops. Um, in around uh, 2010, uh, middle of 2010, is when we saw the groundwater reach a minimum. Um, and then there was a bit of a recovery for the next few years through about 2013 when, when the uh, precipitation levels were above normal uh, in, in northern India. So we actually saw a stabilization and maybe a, a bit of a recovery in the groundwater levels. But... But it looks like uh, uh, since about 2014, um, you start to have a decline again, and particularly now that, that you're back into a drought period, uh, which began you know, roughly uh, sometime in the middle of last year, maybe September, um, the ground levels have been dropping precipitously very, very, very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I think you're, you're getting back into a situation where, where you really have to worry about um, the long-term prospects for groundwater for availability. Uh, well, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is this only in North India that you are observing alarming uh, depletion? Uh, can you give us any data about the rest of India? North India is really where we see a, a big bullseye, sort of a, a, an area of, of, of rapid depletion. Um, uh, originally, we were studying uh, the states of uh, Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan. Um, it also, this depletion extends into Uttar Pradesh and, and some other uh, uh, nearby states. Um, we see it much more in North India than we do in, in Southern India. Um, in fact, in, at times in Southern India, it looks like there's been an increase in, in water. Well, uh, a final question before I get the others, and then I will come back to you. Uh, are these, uh, you know, seasonal? Your experience of uh, water level depletion in other parts of the world, do they get mitigated and completely reversed if there are good rains thereafter? Or are uh, these patterns to a large extent irreversible unless there is human intervention? It really depends on, on the situation. So it was, if it was completely natural variability, you would see ups and downs, and some of those would last uh, many years where you could have a, a, a long interannual cycle of groundwater uh, uh, increase and, and decline. But it's pretty clear that what's happening in northern India is, is there's so much water being, groundwater being pumped out of the ground and used for irrigation. Uh, when it's used for irrigation, most of that water ends up evaporating and then it's gone. And this, is, this has been happening uh, faster than the rate of recharge. So it's really an unsustainable uh, situation. Uh, Mr. Shashi Shekhar, you already have been quoted in the press as saying that way back in 2000, uh, we were already seeing a, a, a depletion in the per capita availability of water. Uh, how grave is the situation now? You know, today, uh, the per capita availability Mm -hmm. would be of the order of about 1400 uh, meter cube per person per year. Mm. Below, in fact, it would be even below, lower than that. Mm. China has declared a, a crisis at 1500 meter cube uh, per person per year. Mm. So we are already reaching, we have already reached the, the, the below the threshold level. Mm -hmm. So we can say that we are fast moving towards crisis. Okay. And uh, we need to now reverse the trend. 
Okay. Uh-huh. And what in your assessment uh, is uh, the na- uh, uh, extent of irreversibility? The, uh, uh, are we in a situation where we will take several years to get out of this crisis? Punjab, Haryana, Pan- uh, UP, Bihar, mm. these are excellent groundwater zones. Mm. These are excellent groundwater zones, which means lot of groundwater tables should be reasonably high or should be uh, much better. But in Punjab, in Haryana, so is in UP, mm. excessive drawl. Mm. Drawl means, you know, you are drawing more than what the groundwater uh, uh, is recharged annually. Mm. Every year, depending on the rainfall, significant quantity goes into the subsoil system and that from the groundwater. Plus, in addition to that, you know, we need to also understand that a large number of rivers which pass through these states mm. would, reach, would continuously recharge the yes. uh, groundwater. But we have, you know, we have diverted water for irrigation purpose. So, one, it is the, it is the excessive, more than the recharge level mm. uh, drawl. Mm. And second is, the rivers are not flowing around the year mm. because of uh, diversion of water. Yeah. So rivers are also not uh, recharging, helping in recharging the groundwater. Fair point. Uh, Arunabha, uh, is, is this problem only a North Indian problem at all? Uh, our severest uh, cries for water have come from Central India, from Marathwada. Would you have any estimates of the extent of uh, ground and surface water depletion in uh, the rest of the country? No, first of all, the, uh, the, the point about North India that Mr. Shekhar was also referring to, the uh, issue is in North and Northwestern India as well as in Southeastern India, mm. we have major, uh, a large number of uh, districts that are affected by severe groundwater uh, shortage. But then if you come to Central India, if you take um, Maharashtra for instance, now Maharashtra as such has uh, uh, amongst all other states the highest amount of uh, sort of water storage uh, in, in reservoirs, but the severity of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, kind of monsoonal conditions over the last two years has led to a, a severe decline. So uh, it's, the levels are lower now than uh, is the case over the last 10 years average. Then there is the question of the kind of cropping pattern. So whether it's sugarcane or whether it's cotton, uh, which uh, are, are uh, primarily grown in okay. that part of the country. So mm-hmm. that then impacts the kind of withdrawals that are, that, that are uh, considered. Okay. And there is the last point, which is also about uh, the industrial sector. While mm-hmm. agriculture does take up 80% of water use in the country, we do have a growing industrial sector. We have a very large growing power sector, yeah. which is going to account for a significant future uh, incremental increase in water demand. All of that will add pressure uh, over and above what Mr. Shekhar was also referring to. Okay. Well, uh, I'm coming to solutions in a minute in terms of cropping patterns and uh, water charges. But uh, uh, one word from uh, uh, Himanshu as well. Uh, Would you have anything more to add in terms of data on uh, water table and their reduction? Actually, groundwater is India's water lifeline. In last two decades, the, all the additional area uh, at the, nat- at the nat- uh, national irrigation area are all coming from groundwater. Mm. Uh, and uh, if you also look at the rural water supply, urban water supply, industrial water supply, most of the additional water that India is using has used in last two decades has come from groundwater. But our water policy, our pol- programs don't even recognize that groundwater is India's water lifeline. Mm. Uh, and and we, nor do we really properly fully understand and uh, acknowledge uh, how does the groundwater recharge happen? What are the systems, the rivers, the forests, the wetlands, the water bodies which recharge the groundwater? Mm-hmm. And because we don't recognize these realities, we don't provide any protection mm-hmm. to uh, these groundwater recharge systems, nor do we provide central place to the groundwater recharge, uh, artificial recharge or enhancing the recharge systems. Mm-hmm. And lastly, most importantly, uh, we do absolutely nothing to regulate groundwater use. Mm. So uh, even if we were to recharge all the in, in, exhaust all the potential of groundwater recharge today, mm. the the use pattern uh, groundwater use pattern is such unsustainable that it will still be depleting. Yeah. So we need to urgently take steps to regulate groundwater use, and groundwater regulation mm. can only happen 
not sitting in Delhi or Bhopal or Ahmedabad or Mumbai, mm -hmm. but it can only happen at the aquifer level, at the community level. Mm -hmm. But we are not really moving in that direction at all. Okay. So all the issues of cropping pattern and others mm -hmm. will fall in place if we address these issues. I, no, I take your and point. Of course, we uh, need no, to Himanshu, store. Last one point. Yeah, sure, one point. Sure. That we need to, of course, store the water. You know, we have water available from monsoon in three, four months. Mm -hmm. And we need to store that. Mm -hmm. But the groundwater aquifers is the most benign environment, yeah. environmentally, socially and economically, mm -hmm. benign uh, storage option. Absolutely. And we are again not looking at it seriously. Okay. Well, uh, let me start uh, the discussion on, uh, you know, the remedial steps to be taken. Let's start with uh, uh, the central government itself. Uh, uh, Mr. Shekhar, what are the steps being taken? Is there any thought process at all of changing cropping patterns or imposing water levies and water charges? Uh, the points which uh, uh, Himanshu Thakkar raised, mm. actually this is the crux. We need to understand are the following. Mm. Number one, that in this country, 65% of uh, the total irrigation area, mm. irrigated area, mm. is by the groundwater. Mm. Number two, 85 percent of rural drinking water supply is by the ground, groundwater. Mm. Third, almost 60-65 percent of the urban water needs are do come from the groundwater. Mm. And most importantly, which uh, Himanshu uh, uh, pointed out, mm. in the last four decades, the net 84 percent of the net increase in irrigation irrigated area is has come from the groundwater. Mm. So groundwater is, is the central to the entire water use in this country and it's the lifeline. Once you, once, uh, you, know, once you, ha once you extensively re recharge the groundwater up by construction of a large number of percolation tanks, reviving the old uh, tanks, thousands and thousands of tanks which our forefathers had uh, created and constructed, which unfortunately either are silted up or uh, encroached upon. Mm. So after extensive recharge of the groundwater, you know how much of water is available to a community, to a village. So once you understand the total water available, mm. that amount of water must last for 365 days. Yes. You get you get rainwater only for in 90 days yeah. and you have to use that amount of stored water for 365 days. One thing, one thing that we need to do is to make our community understand as how to do water budgeting. Mm. A, B, then the fix the priorities. The priorities have to be first meeting the human needs, second meeting the cattle needs mm. and then whatever is available you decide what should be a cropping pattern. Mm. Should you go for sugar cane or paddy mm. or should you go for low water intensive crop? Yeah. Now all the successful examples, mm. Hevre Bajar or in in a number of districts, Jalana yes. districts of Maharashtra, there are quite a number of examples where first they did extensive storage of water through rainwater harvesting. Yes. Second, they did water budgeting. Third, the community as a whole decided what should be the cropping pattern. Mm. And then accordingly they went about irrigating the land. So they switched over from sugarcane to uh, pomegranate mm. to um, uh, grapes like that. Uh, Mr. Rodel, I wanted to ask you the international experience. Uh, have there been successful cases of uh, reversing the trend of depletion? If that has been achieved, how has that been achieved? Uh, I actually don't know of any examples of, of reversing the trend. It's very difficult to, uh, to, to take away a resource once, um, uh, once people get used to using it. So in this, in this case, groundwater. Um, but what obviously needs to happen is, uh, is that the, the um, policies need to change um, to right now in some cases there there are actually incentives for using water where there's you know free electricity for pumping groundwater that should be reversed you know not only should it be uh, uh, you know you pay for your own electricity to pump the groundwater but you need but there should be some sort of regulations well uh, let me come to Arunabha uh, Arunabha uh, uh, Shekhar has clearly pointed out that uh, you know this has to be decentralized and there has to be water budgeting in communities and the prioritizing of available water. Uh, 
you know, the leadership in these things have normally come from the central government and a little less from the state governments as well. So, what are the responsibilities of the central government? Should we expect something in terms of imposing water charges or f forcing state governments to see the necessity of water metering and water charges? What are the responsibilities of the two levels of government? Uh, you know, uh, j just to pick up on the community's f point for a second, the, the point is while, I, and I completely agree, the co community-led crop water budgeting is the way forward at a certain level of governance. Mm. But then, uh, we need to also add on to that, you know, the agricultural pricing, energy pricing, um, which have something to do with the state governments. Mm -hmm. And then the, we often say the central government does not have full control over water because water is a state subject. But actually, under the constitution, water is uh, and natural resources are held in public trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and the central government does have a remit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we and, and some of the draft laws that have been put forward are encouraging because the central government has to exercise its leverage over state governments mm -hmm. in terms of water resources that are crossing state boundaries yes. in terms of water water resources that are being over withdrawn as mr shaker was being was pointing out and we need to make sure that uh, the pricing of agricultural commodities mm -hmm. and the pricing of energy is clearly linked to the consequences it has on water yep. unless we use that leverage it's going to be very difficult mm -hmm. the other thing that the central government can certainly do is significantly support the uh, part of the capital investment in the big, big build out of the water recharge structures mm. across at least the uh, severely affected districts. Mm. And the third thing that can be done, and it's a slightly longer period issue, but uh, it, it's important, is significantly greater investment in the measurement of water uh, and water withdrawals mm. from the ground. Mm. Uh, we, the, the ratio is approximately 1 is to 500 in terms of the water recharge structures versus uh, the, the, the measurement structures that we actually have. So our understanding mm. of water withdrawals itself is very poor. Yeah. So for the central government to have that leverage of the states, the investment in the water recharge structures, the investment in the data collection, mm. and getting the states and the central government together on agriculture and energy pricing reform is probably what we can get going mm. for now. But this is not going to be resolved overnight. Uh, this is a handy set of uh, steps that you are giving us. Uh, uh, gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining me in this extremely useful conversation. Some of the key takeaways uh, from our guests. Uh, one, that uh, this has to be an extremely decentralized effort and every community should be able to uh, budget it, so maintain its own uh, groundwater and surface water resources, budget it and prioritize its need. Uh, second, a very key takeaway coming in is that uh, agricultural prices should be set in such a way that water guzzling crops be discouraged and uh, water saving and uh, 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 crops using less water be encouraged. Likewise, power subsidies be given in, power subsidies not be given in such a fashion that uh, water is used indiscriminately. And fourth, very important, that enough uh, effort and money is uh, invested in data collection, in understanding the gravity of the problem, so that states and communities are apprised of the uh, importance and the extent of the crisis. Uh, that's uh, what we've got from our experts. Uh, 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 a shuddering thought coming from Matthew Rodell that there are very few instances across the world of uh, depleting water resources actually getting replenished or reversed. That's a chilling thought. You have to take a break. After that, we'll be joined by Mr. Ashok Gulati with his views on how cropping patterns may be reversed. We're back in a minute.